But what I'm going to talk about today is um, the how output stoma and try and give you a rational guide um, to how you can manage a high output stoma if you have a high output stoma and how your medical and nursing uh, attendants will be managing your high output stoma based on anatomy and physiology. So I know you've had lots of talks in the past because I've sat in on some of them about high output stomas, but what I wanted to do, which is something slightly different, is to explain why these things happen and what the basis for high output is, how it arises, and therefore logically what you can try and do to address it. Um, some disclosures. I should point out, I'm not sure if any of you can see, could we have the lights down a little bit? Is that possible? I'm not sure if any of you can see this, this painting. Does anybody recognize this painting? This is a very famous painting. Does anyone recognize the artist? Yeah, it's a Lowry. The interesting thing about this painting is actually um, this person here in the corner. That person in the corner is Peter McEvity. Um, and it's a painting in the outpatient department at Ancoats Hospital uh, in North Manchester, because Lowry was a Salford, Salfordian. Um, Peter McEvity was a surgeon. Brian McEvity was Peter's son, and Brian McEvity was a surgeon in Newcastle who trained me. And Brian McEvity has this picture. So he has a picture, he has an original Lowry with his own father visible in it, which I think is really cool, actually. But there we are. So some disclosures. I'm, I'm a consultant surgeon at Northern Care Alliance. Um, I do provide expert medical medico legal advice to NHS resolution in the courts and the Republic of Ireland. I'm also an unpaid advisor to NICE, to NHS England's Acute Deterioration Board, and the counsellor of the British Journal of Surgery. What I don't have are any links at all to any of the pharmaceutical products I'm going to be talking about here, but I will confess to liking the odd marshmallow, and I'll explain why that might be relevant later. So what I'm going to talk about is what, what is a high output stoma? What does it actually mean to have a high output stoma? Um, and obviously, to recognize high output, you have to recognize what is normal output, and how and where in the bowel are salts and electrolytes and fluids absorbed. Therefore, what are the implications of a high output stoma for problems with water and electrolyte absorption? And then for, by extension, how can we try and manage that problem? Ideally, um, how can we manage that ourselves? And how should the people who, who provide care for us, doctors and nurses, manage those problems? So, just a quick refresher of bowel anatomy. Um, here are some pictures of the gastrointestinal tract on the left with the duodenum at the very top, the small bowel in the middle, the colon around the edge. And on the top right, a picture of the entire colon. Now, the colon itself is your large bowel, and it's approximately a metre long. And your colon absorbs something in the region of 500 mils of water and salt each day. What we'd recognize, actually, is that the colon's actually much more than that. It's actually a very clever organ. It's involved in lots of other functions, as well as salt and water absorption. It actually does have the capacity to contribute to energy uh, absorption. Um, it's able to recycle something called urea, which, which has nutritional value to your body. Um, and you may have heard or may have read in the newspapers a lot of interest in something called the microbiome. It's a really interesting fact that I think a lot of people don't appreciate that most of the DNA in your body as you sit there now is not yours. It's actually bacteria DNA within your body, which is a rather worrying thought. But actually, for those of us who have a colon, most of that bacterial DNA is sitting in our colons. We have a microbial population which has a whole host of functions, potentially all, uh, affects our appetite, our mood, it contributes to health. It probably also contributes to disease. It's been shown to be involved in, in obesity. Uh, so lots of exciting things about the content of the large bowel and implications for health. The small intestine is three to 600 centimeters long, 
And the upper two-fifths is called the jejunum, as in jejun, meaning empty, and that's because in the old days, anatomists who were in the dissecting room found the upper part of the small bowel was usually empty when they opened it at post-mortem examination. The lower three-fifths is called the ilium. There's a valve where the small bowel joins the colon, and the small bowel's main role is nutrient absorption, but it also plays an important role in fluid and electrolyte absorption. That's water and salt, effectively, but particularly at the bottom of the small bowel, and that is really very, very important, and I'll explain in a minute. Now, I think um, many years ago, um, Miriam Stoppard explained that the lining of your bowel is extremely complex, and it's composed of a whole series of folds, and within the folds, there are further folds, and on top of those folds, there are even further folds, such that if you, if you stretched out your entire bowel mucosa, it covering three or four tennis courts in surface area, you'd probably die, uh, which wasn't a very useful observation. But what it, I think, served to, to exemplify is that there's a huge surface area available for the absorption, not only of food, but of fluid and of water in your bowel. And in particular, are these things called villi, these finger-like processes on the lining of the small intestine. And there are little crypts at the base, and the cells come out of the crypts, and they migrate to the top of the villi, and then they're shed every few days. And that's a continuous process. And what we know is that that linkage between the cells in your bowel is essential for controlling the passage of water and salt and nutrients across your bowel. So here is a schematic of the lining of your bowel. And you can see here, at the top there's the lumen. That's where things are going in and out. And between the cells of the bowel, there are these things called tight junctions. And tight junctions are very important when it comes to salt and water absorption, as I'll show you in a minute. Under the cells, there are these supporting layers, including muscle and blood vessels and nerves. And there's, at, effectively, at the, other, at the other side, there's the bloodstream. And the relevance of this is that there is active transport in your bowel of nutrients and salts, and that's going through the cell. So the nutrients are absorbed into the cells, and then they are pumped out of the cells into your bloodstream. However, between the cells, there is a passive flow of water, and that flow of water follows the process of absorption of the nutrients. And that happens between the cells. And the tightness of the tight junctions determines whether the water comes through and then stays on the bloodstream side, or it comes through and can actually just diffuse back and forth randomly. And that's really important, as I'll show you in a minute. The these are not imaginary things. These are some pictures of some of our own research in our own lab. Here are electron micrographs of the lining of, bowel, of, of uh, the bowel mucosa. And you can see at the top the little finger-like processes. And you can see down here this dark patch. Those are the tight junctions between the cells. So we know that roughly seven or eight liters of water goes into and is absorbed from the small intestine every day. Some of that is what you drink, some of it is secretions from your stomach, from your liver in the form of bile, from pancreatic juice, from bowel juice, but that fluid enters your bowel and then it's reabsorbed out of your bowel into your bloodstream. And ultimately that leaves about half a litre to a litre going into the large bowel every day and your large bowel absorbs pretty much all of that apart from about 250 mils. And that process of absorption, as I've shown you, depends to a very considerable extent on active transport. And sodium, salt in other words, and glucose are actively transported together. They're what's called co-transported. So if you can imagine a car, you've got a driver and a passenger. The car won't actually go properly unless you've got both people in the front. And here you've got sodium, salt molecules, and glucose molecules, both sitting on this transporter, going through the bowel, and then being pumped into the bloodstream. And water follows that process, but it follows it through the tight junctions. That's really important, 
because if the tight junctions are leaky, water can diffuse back into the gut lumen. And if the, gut, if the tight junctions are tight, the water will stay where it is. It will stay on the bloodstream side. And we know that the tight junctions in the jejunum are extremely leaky. So salt and water are pumped into the bloodstream, but actually the water can diffuse back into the lumen of the bowel. That's not good for water and salt absorption. In the ileum, the tight junctions are tighter. Nobody knows yet why they're tighter and whether that can be regulated. But the ileum is much better at absorbing water than the jejunum. And the colon has extremely tight, tight junctions. And that makes the colon very good at absorbing water. So water and salt are most easily absorbed in the colon and then the ileum and then the jejunum. And that's a problem, because if we remove someone's colon, we remove an important organ for water absorption. And most of the diseases that affect the small bowel that we treat preferentially affect the bottom of your small bowel, unfortunately. So they have an intrinsic impact on water absorption. So if you lose the colon, there is a normal mean daily stoma output of up to about 750 mils. And the loss of your small bowel, the lower small bowel, will have a much greater impact on salt and water absorption than the loss of your jejunum. If you have less than about 200 centimetres of small bowel, like some of my patients do, um, like this man here, who's actually only got, this is the totality of his bowel. It's 80 centimetres of jejunum. He has no colon. He's lost the rest of his small bowel. He will be putting out about three and a half litres out of his stoma every day, even if he drinks very little, because most of it is the fluid that's already being secreted into his bowel. And those patients need intravenous fluid and intravenous nutrition all the time. So as you're going to hear from Sheila very shortly, your body can usually compensate for the loss of maybe half a litre, maybe even a litre of water and about 70 millimoles of, of salt, that's about four grams, because your kidneys can take up the slack. You can improve water absorption, you can improve salt reabsorption in your kidneys. So actually, even if you've got half your colon, it's unusual to get salt and water depletion. But actually, 15 to 20% of new ileostomates, so new patients who have an ileostomy, have significant episodes of fluid and electrolyte depletion, requiring at least short periods of admission to hospital in the first couple of months after their surgery. So we know that what you, what you drink and eat will dramatically affect your stoma output. And the key word here is osmosis. So if you have osmotically active molecules, those are small molecules, it could be salt, it could be poorly absorbed sugars. If they are in your, the lumen of your bowel, they will pull fluid back into the lumen of your bowel, particularly across the jejunum. And that will sharply increase stoma output. And also, because of the co-transporter I was telling you about, glucose and salt are very well absorbed if you give them together. And that's why we have these rehydration solutions based on glucose and salt. Okay? Um, if you have no colon, you lose the safety net required. So if you are taking sugar-free mints, sugar-free foods, sugar-free drinks, which are full of these osmotic... They're sugar-free. They contain molecules which aren't absorbed by your body. They taste sweet... That's how they work, but they're not taken up into your body. They stay in your bowel, and they will pull fluid in with them, and therefore your output will increase. Rehydration solutions, I'm afraid, are actually quite poorly understood, not just by the general public, but actually by the medical and the nursing professions. I regularly see patients who are discharged with relatively high output stomas who are told when they get home by their doctors to drink as much as possible on the basis that that will help. But the problem is, you get into an, a vicious cycle where you get thirsty, so you drink more. And the more you drink, the more comes out of your stoma. And the thirstier you get. And it's not just about volume, it's actually about what you're actually drinking. So it's important to avoid hypotonic solutions like pure water, because that will just wash water and salt out of your body. Sugar-free things like diet pop are particularly bad. Some sport drinks, you need to look at the tonicity. Some sport drinks are not isotonic. They're hypotonic, and they're not good for you either. 
the ideal thing to drink if you have a high output stoma actually has the same concentration as plasma. It's about 100 to 100 millimoles per litre of, of, of salt. That's pretty impalatable. It's difficult to tolerate. But actually, that's the best thing to drink if you want to maintain water and electrolyte balance. And St. Mark's solution, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is, is the ideal example of that. But it's horrible to drink. It's very salty. And the only advice I can give you is if you have it really cold, it makes it rather less unpalatable. Single strength diorolite is much easier to drink, it's perhaps not quite as effective, but it's a reasonable substitute for people, except with the very highest outputs. And there are a whole array of drugs that you can take, and I'm sure you're all aware of these. Loperamide, you can take up to 16 milligrams four times daily. I see a lot of patients who GP say, oh, no, 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 you mustn't take that. It's two milligrams three times daily. You shouldn't have any more than that. That might be true for traveler's diarrhea, but it's not going to help you if you have a high output ileostomy. Um, that works because it reduces gut activity and it gives the gut more time to absorb salt and water. Codeine phosphate, up to 60 milligrams four times daily, has the same effect. Um, Again, you need to be careful. Some of these things are available as, as sugar-free solutions. Sugar-free means they're going to hold water in your bowel, which actually defeats the purpose. So syrups, which are based on sugar-free syrups, are not going to be of help to you. They actually may make you worse, or at least you won't get the benefit. Instants, the Imodium instants, which you can dissolve under your tongue, they work immediately. They are more expensive. GPs don't like prescribing them. Um, but a lot of patients find them very effective. Um, omeprazole, um, some of you may be aware of, it's a substance which reduces gastric acid production, so it reduces the amount of fluid being secreted at the top end of your bowel. Less fluid going in at the top end, less fluid going out at the bottom end. And then finally, octreotide, which is a hormone you can have by injection. There are some long-acting versions of that. They reduce gut secretion and gut motility. The problem is they hurt, they sting. They're not very pleasant. They also have effects which are sometimes unwanted on liver function. So we tend not to use that very frequently. And then, you'll know more about this than I do. There's all sorts of folklore. Um, Jelly babies are good for stoma output, are they? Well, some people think they are. There's no evidence to support that. Um, Madeira cake, I've heard some of my patients swear by. Um, arrowroot biscuits. Um, I come from a, near Wigan, so pies. <laughs> pies are very popular in Wigan. I, I don't, I'm not sure they have any effect on stoma output. It's just an excuse to eat more pies if you live in Wigan. Um, pasta. The only... The only food stuff for which there's actually randomized controlled trial evidence is the marshmallow. And there is good evidence that eating marshmallows, three of them, three times daily, is associated with a reduction in stoma output. Don't get too excited. The average or the median was 75 mils, which is about four tablespoons full. So I suspect they might be worth eating marshmallows, but not for the effect on stoma output, I'm afraid. Um, stoma output will always be variable, just like the output of your bowel normally would be variable, but because you've got no colon, the output will be exaggerated, um, particularly during illness. So we know that diarrheal illnesses, um, normally if you get food poisoning, you're going to have diarrhea. If you have no colon and you get food poisoning, you're going to have a very high output stoma, and you're going to be much more likely to become unwell. For some reason, infection for any reason, um, Sepsis, notably, will, will affect your tight junctions and will be associated with a sharp increase in stoma output. An incomplete bowel obstruction, again, rather paradoxically, can affect stoma output. When should you be concerned, and Sheila's going to pick this up in a minute, I think, if you are excessively thirsty, if you know that your output has been excessively watery for a significant period, if your urine becomes concentrated or you stop passing urine, if you have cramps in your hands and legs, that suggests significant salt depletion. If you have tingling and numbness around your mouth, you should be contacting your GP or hospital. They will want to do blood tests and potentially check your wee to look at the salt levels in your urine. They may need to give you intravenous fluid and uh, particularly salt and water replacement. And most importantly, they will want to look for the underlying cause and correct it if need be. 
So to summarize, ileostomy output's usually less than a liter, and most people will cope well with that, but if you have an ileostomy, you are intrinsically, unfortunately, gonna be more prone to dehydration and salt depletion. Understanding how the gut works will help, particularly in selecting what you eat and drink. You should pay attention to your oral intake and particularly avoid sugar-free drinks and foods and fizzy drinks. Sugar-free pop is bad. You shouldn't really be drinking that if you have a, a relatively high output stoma. The natural response to thirst, which is just to drink more water if you're thirsty, is likely to be counterproductive if you have an ileostomy. Uh, the rehydration solutions and antidiarrheals are the key to managing that. It's by all means have your arrowroot biscuits and pies and marshmallows, but don't expect miracles from them. Um, and by all means, seek advice. The IA are here for you. Ask your dietitians, ask your stoma nurses, ask your GPs, ask your hospital doctors and nurses. And I think at that point, I will stop.